الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين We are continuing to track what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about and to people We are the subject We are the major subject in the Quran We are the major subject of the Quran The Quran is about you It's about your creation, your purpose, your place in the universe, your mission on earth, your destiny in the hereafter, what kind of creature you are. It's about the rest of the universe as it relates to you and as you relate to it. So you are the most important subject the Quran is about and is for. So. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that this book was sent for us. So it is about us. It is for our own best interest. Uh, in this section, uh, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown us the division and types of people, as we mentioned about four types of people, right? The believers, the disbelievers, the hypocrites, the fasiqoon, and the khasirun here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after giving us this map that shows where everybody is what everybody does to clear the choices for us now he is giving us the story of our existence where did we come from and what we came to do and who has created us and for what purpose this is the central piece of the Quran. So here it goes, ayah number 30 in Surah Al-Baqarah. And remember and behold, when Allah told the angels, I am going to create or set or place a steward, a successor, a vicegerent, somebody who is going to succeed each other. This is from which comes the word Khalifa. Khalifa is someone who succeeds someone and is succeeded by someone to follow. So the word Khalifa brings the issue of Khilafa, right? So it's a buzzword in the media, it's a buzzword with politicians as they always manipulate terminologies for their own political gain or policies or ideas. The word Khalifa is clearly talking about Adam, the first Khalifa, right? So what does Adam succeed if he is the first Khalifa? Well, he succeeds the creations that came before him. Who was created before Adam? The jinn wa were created and the angels were created before Adam. So Adam, as the first human being, and humans, as the children of Adam, they become successors of who came before them. But those creatures are never absent to be succeeded. But successor could also mean someone who follows, follows on the footsteps. Like, for example, they say that the child is a successor, Khalifa, his father, right? Because he succeeds him, he represents him, and so on and so forth. So Khalifa for Adam is that he is succeeding those who came before him. He came after. 
So succeed means someone who comes after. Could we call man Khalifatullah, the Khalifa of Allah? That is a big term. It could be said, but only to say that Allah is the one who put him as a Khalifa. Not that he succeeds Allah. Nobody succeeds Allah. كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Everyone and everything will perish, whatever is on the earth, and Allah and his glorious face will continue to be there. So there is no such a thing as Khalifatullah as we use the word Khalifa between humans and other creatures. But Khalifatullah means someone appointed by Allah to do a certain job. So he is a designee. He is appointed by Allah. So what is he designated to do on earth? First, I need to talk about the word earth first. Some of us believe, and unfortunately this is very prevalent among Muslims and non-Muslims alike, that the only reason Adam was sent from heaven to earth is because Adam disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He violated Allah's commandment. But here is Allah telling us and telling the angels before he had created Adam that Adam was meant to be a khalifa on earth, not somewhere else. Fil ard. That is our place. That is our residence that is our dwelling this is where we live so there is no confusion there is no ambiguity about the fact that adam was created to be on earth so why did allah take him to paradise we'll get to this but was he meant to stay in paradise we'll also get to talk about this in few minutes but i wanted to clear the fact that adam was not entered into paradise for permanent residence. He didn't have the green card for paradise yet. He would earn it on earth, and after he qualifies, he will be readmitted to the place. But the purpose that Allah exposed him to paradise and the experience in paradise is to show us through him how pleasant that place is. How magnificent, how beautiful, how attractive, so that when Adam and other prophets tell us about it, we believe what they are telling us. They, at least in the form of Adam, he has witnessed it. So when he or his children talk about it, it is not only revelation, but it runs in our blood, in our innate nature, that we all want to go to paradise. Even people who don't believe in the hereafter, they believe in the concept of paradise, but they want to make this earth paradise which is not meant for it to be. So even atheists would like to have paradise, but they want to make it with their own hands here because they have no other place according to their belief or lack thereof to call paradise, so they want to make it here. So. The Prophet ﷺ captures this, saying, "Al-Jannatu sijnu al-Mu'min al-Dunya." Afwan, dak Allah khair. Al-Dunya sijnu al-Mu'min wa Jannatu al-Kafir. This life for the believer is like a prison, but we love it. It's very attractive. Yeah, it has been decorated. It has been made to make to look good. It has been made to appear good, attractive, pleasant. But it is not. So when the Quran talks about the beauty of this life, it doesn't say this life is beautiful. It says Zuyina. Zuyina. It was made beautiful for people. Hubbu shahawati min al-nisa, lusting after woman. والبنين and children and القناطير المقنطرة من الذهب والفضة everything that looks beautiful here is made to look beautiful and it's made to look beautiful by one of two either Allah makes it beautiful to you because you are a believer 
and he wants you to enjoy it to the maximum allowed. To the maximum allowed by him. So there are limits in this life. And when there are limits, it means what? You are in a big prison. It's called the earth. As a believer in a prison, those people who have power on earth, they act like the prison guards. They want to control you. They want to manage you. They want to manipulate you. They want you to be their slave. So long as you are in the prison. If you submit to them, you lose everything. But if you become the servant of Allah, a slave for Allah, then you are free. You are not in that cage. You are out of the control of anybody. You're only in the control of Allah. So the earth is not meant to be paradise or a substitute thereof. It is not. This concept has to settle. And when it settles with us, we understand a great deal of our purpose on earth. And we'll talk about this in a few minutes. But primarily, we need to settle this issue. Why did Allah take Adam to paradise? Why didn't Allah let him live there? We would have been very happy. Why did Eve tempt Adam? Eve didn't tempt Adam. We'll get to know who did this job, right? It is the shaitan. It's not Eve. Eve is not the source of evil. We just need to settle those issues. Most, if not all, of these stories are imported from biblical writings. It has nothing to do with Moses' teaching, Jesus' teaching, or Muhammad's teachings. They taught us the truth, and that is not part of it. So Allah is telling the angels. Why does Allah tell the angels? Because he is going to require them to serve this new creation. Amazing. Allah who could not be served by anybody. Nobody could serve Allah. He gets everything done by one word, two-letter word, kun fayakun, be, and it is. So he is going to assign the angels certain duties in the service of this new creature. They will be carrying the throne, that is the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? They will be revolving around the throne, tawaf, Right? But they will also be engaged in both the praise of Allah and asking Allah to forgive all humans, but specifically the believers. What a service. Allah knew that we are going to sin and we are going to forget that we have sinned. And we are going to forget to ask him to forgive our sins. So he has angels 24-7 seeking Allah's forgiveness for the believers. Seeking Allah's forgiveness for the believers. That's one of their major functions. Other functions would be like sending Allah's revelation to humans, delivering this revelation to humans like Angel Jibreel. Right? The angels will receive your spirit. They will take it out of your body at the time of your death and deliver it back to Allah, the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angels will show your way in the hereafter. Where are you heading? Either that they will usher those who don't believe into hellfire or they would lead the believers into paradise. So they have lots of functions. They have lots of functions. They also would blow from the spirit that Allah gives to every human being. They will blow that spirit into the human being at the time of turning from a fetus into a living human being, 120 days into pregnancy. So those angels are not unimportant because we don't see them. They are very important. They are very central in our life. They also protect us from some of what Allah puts us through. يحفظونه من أمر الله له معقبات من بين يديه ومن خلفه يحفظونه من أمر الله. It's amazing, amazing ayah. 
that he has protectors, kind of like, what do you call a support system, right? From bef ahead of you and from behind you. You know when a president is walking and he has guards around him, ahead of him, next to him, and behind him, right? You have angels. Just imagine that you are in the company of the angels. Those are the closest to Allah and we are still disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sets them as guards and protectors. I told you the story before about a girl who fell from the 14th floor in Skyline Towers. And she's still alive today. 14th floor, four year old. She had some minor or major surgeries into the stomach with cuts and bruises and stuff, but she made it. Did she make it? We say she did, right? No, Allah made it. The angels carried her down and delivered her peacefully where she belongs. She's still alive because the angels carried her. You know that in any accident, most of the accidents, whether it is a plane crash or plane catching fire or a ship sinking, we from time to time see the vast majority of the people on board die. But we see a couple of children here, a person here, an elderly here who have not died. Who carried them through but Allah? And who was protecting them ahead of them and behind them, catching them up straight and running down against the smoke or the fire? Allah made this facility automatically yours. You don't have to call 911. You don't have to wait for somebody to come. They are there. You say, Ya Allah, and they are there for you. They go into work right away. If Allah wants life for you, they will support it. If Allah wants you back, they will execute it. So angels are very important. So when somebody asks, why does Allah speak to angels? Because they are going to be assigned to serve this creature. I hope this is clear. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ قَالُوا as a matter of commentary أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ Obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inspired them in a way we do not know about the nature of this creature. Because they themselves will tell us that this is what happened. How do we know? When Allah asks them to, uh, to nominate whatever things that he presents for them, they will say, لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا. So if this is a piece of knowledge, where do they get it? From Allah. How? It is not our job. It's not mentioned. So they say, أتجعل فيها ما يفسد فيها ويسفك الدماء وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ Would you place therein someone who would deny you, who would corrupt and spread mischief and bloodshed on earth? Is this, do, do you plan to bring, is, is this the one that you're talking about? So they knew beforehand and they were only inquiring, they were not questioning. It is wrong to believe they were questioning. They were asking a question of inquiry. Is it the same person? So man here means the one. Man here means the one who would spread corruption and shed blood. So they knew about this one. They asked, is this the one that you're talking about? Right? And because what they said was the most negative description of man, Allah answered them the way he did. قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ I know the rest of this man, I know I am creating him, and I know what you do not know. In fact, I know and you know nothing. So, this is not questioning Allah, this is not interrogating Allah, this is not second-guessing Allah, 
because angels by definition لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم they are in full constant submission to Allah so you are not go- they are not going to question or uh, object to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to do and they mention the best of what they do which is نسبح بحمدك ونقدس لك أن كل أعمال الملائكة طيبة لأنهم خلق طيب خلقوا من نور all the actions of the angels are good actions so they mention the best of what they do which is praising Allah glorifying Allah and they mention the worst that man would do you see the contracts it was not fair so Allah told them leave it to me I know what you do not know uh, this is a statement for all of us also to recognize Allah was not only talking to the angels since he recorded it for us and since the angels the closest to Allah were told I know and you do not know we better believe that we are much less than the angels we, we better believe that in knowledge in closeness to Allah we wish we could act like the angels never disobey but we are humans right never disagree but we are humans never question but we are humans never doubt but we are humans right so the angels are not with those type of negative qualities but still Allah told them I know what you do not know and he would tell them soon here that he does he knows what they do not know and what we do not know وعلم آدم الأسماء كلها and he taught Adam the names of all things what does the word all here mean before I venture to answer I need to read the rest of the ayah the rest of the ayah says ثم عرضهم Allah presented those things so Adam was questioned about certain things right to nominate them to name them right and the angels were presented with them so the word all it means all what Allah presented to both the word all so that somebody wouldn't say oh does Adam know the word computer does Adam know the microchip does Adam know this that is frivolous and unwarranted Adam was taught the names of what things it says all which means all what all things that will ever be created all things in the world or all things around him or all things Allah presented him the word that comes which says and Allah presented those things to the angels it means they were definitive list of things right so he presented them to the angels and said tell me the names of those things if you are truthful or if you are true if you are true refers to the claim that they are better than Adam so Allah wanted to prove to them that even though they are closest to him he taught Adam the names of things that he did not teach them to put them in place and to appreciate Adam that Allah is creating and to do this Allah made this experiment if you will to show Adam things name these things the angels are surprised and he tells them you name those things if you truly know if you are truth, truthful that you believe you are better show me show me which means Allah when he follows and ask the angels to prostrate to Adam he has already proven that Adam is worth their prostration but the prostration was not to his person and we'll get to handle this in a minute so here tell me the names of those things if you truly are truthful 
They said, Subhanak, all glory and praise are yours. Subhanak. La ilma lana illa ma allamtana. We have no knowledge except what you teach us. What you taught us is our knowledge. So you didn't teach us this? One may ask, but those things apparently were present, right? But Allah picked certain things to do this questioning and presentation and ask Adam to name those things and ask the angels. Why didn't he teach the angels the names of those things? It's an invalid question. Allah did what he willed, right? Do you want to second guess him? The angels did not second guess him, right? But the angels were so much taken aback by the fact that they knew that this creature was going to do so many bad things and they were just wondering, is this the one that you want you are going to create and place on earth? Also, most probably, those things were relevant to Adam's life and irrelevant to the angel's life. They didn't need it. So Allah didn't teach them. And in that is a miracle in itself because he is telling them, you have your life and Adam has his life. You have your things and Adam will have his. And each of you is a world by itself. True, you will have relationships that I manage, but you are subject to me and I want to create a creature who would succeed each other generation after generation and come to submit to me voluntarily. You are compelled. You see now? So to compel them, he brought them those things to identify which they couldn't. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَلِيمُ الْحَكِيمُ You are the all-knowing, all-wise. So then Allah turns to Adam. Adam named those things for them. يَا آدَمُ أَنْبِئُهُمْ بِأَسْمَائِهِمْ فَلَمَّا أَنْبَأَهُمْ بِأَسْمَائِهِمْ قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكُمْ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ غَيْبَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَأَعْلَمُ مَا تُبْدُونَ وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْتُمُونَ Now that Adam named those items, item after item after item, nobody knows how many, and the angels shocked. This creature knows everything, it seems. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell them, haven't I told you before that I know what is hidden and unknown in heavens and in the earth? And I know, and I know what you conceal and what you reveal. What you conceal in yourself and what you reveal when you speak and when you behave and when you act. That also is as true for us as it is for the angels. Allah knows what we con communicate openly and what we keep secret. Even not only secret, but the secret and what is behind the secret. يَعْلَمُ السِّرَّ وَأَخْفَى What is more hidden than the secret. Okay, so the secret is what I do not speak. What else could be hidden beyond a secret? It is what is in your heart of hearts, which is called ذات الصدور. إن الله عليم بذات الصدور. Your your core, your essence of what is in your heart is a book that's open to Allah subhanahu wa taala. It's no secret. وأعلم ما تبدون. I know what you reveal. وَمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْتُمُونَ And what you were concealing. They were trying to tell Allah, we know how evil that creature will be. And Allah showed them that how productive and effective this creature could be. Something they did not think about. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after proving to them that Adam is a very important creature to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels to prostrate to Adam, not for Adam. When we prostrate, 
we prostrate towards what? Al Kaaba. Do we worship Al Kaaba? Likewise, angels were not instructed to worship Adam, but to prostrate to Allah facing Adam, which means in humility to the power of Allah in creating this. He becomes like a qibla for the angels. Amazing. Qibla? Angels. Angels look at you when they praise Allah. Angels look at you when they worship Allah. This is what the ayah says. Isjudu li Adam. Prostrate towards Adam to appreciate him. فَسَجَدُوا They all prostrated. إِلَّا Iblis, Except for Iblis. Some people confuse the fact that here is an exception statement. إِلَّا Iblis, Adat istithna. And they assume that every mustathna is part of the mustathna minnu. And indeed, Iblis was with the angels, right? He was with them, but he is not of them. We know that Al-Jinn, Makhluq Min Nar. Jinn is made out of fire. Angels are made out of light. So those are not one and the same. So Iblis was not from the angels, the Quran says, Kana min al jinn. He was from the jinn. And the jinn is a third creature. The angels, the humans, and the jinn. The angels and the humans were created first, and the angels and the jinn were created first, and the humans came after. So Iblis, because he is evil, as soon as the order came to prostrate to Adam, he remembered his greatness and acted in arrogance. The angels expressed not reservation, but they expressed that the information they got from Allah about Adam are not very promising. But is he the one that you're going to put on earth? Is he? Iblis saw a competition with that new creature. Why didn't the angels see man as a competition? And why did Iblis see man as a competition? Because jinn were instructed to voluntarily believe in Allah and worship Allah. And they were given free choices and free will like humans. So he was right that we have a competition between us and the jinn. Who is going to please Allah? Who is going to be obedient? It's, it's an open competition. So Iblis was right to take Adam for a competition. But he was not right to let his pride and self-conceit lead him to arrogance and disobedience to Allah and rebellion against Allah's command. That was not right for him. Illa Iblis, Abba, he refused. Was takbar, he acted in arrogance and he ended up becoming among the disbelievers. So now another element is injected here. We are not alone, the Quran is telling us. We are here with angels, right? And we are here with the jinn. The jinn is a world that we have to be careful dealing with it. We know that the jinn could do a lot of things for you. If you want to be a kafir like them and use them and you learn the tricks, you are able to do that. But this kind of magic, black magic, is prohibited. It's haram. And in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that man ata kahinan aw arrafan أو ساحرا فقد كفر بما أنزل على محمد Making sihr is kufr 
no question, no discussion about it. Why? Because you go to the black magic maker for him to do things for you that you are not supposed to do. And you're not supposed to ask anyone for it but Allah. Well, no, but I use this black magic maker to make my wife love me or my husband or my mother-in-law. Well, if you want anybody to love you, you go to the jinn to force this person to love you by making you beautiful against your own nature, right? Why don't you act righteously and everybody would love you? Why don't you behave nicely and everybody would love you? Nature is better than magic. Normal is better than magic. So going to a magician or black magic maker amounts to kufr, clear, clear kufr. Likewise, if you go to a sorcerer or kahin, it is the same. It is the same. Here we have Adam, which is the father of humans, and we have Satan. This competition that Iblis faced Adam with, with so much hatred, not only competition, so much hatred for that new creature that he vowed that he would manipulate his descendants, his children. They will be manipulated. I will chew them up. Look at the words. I will chew them up and I will be the first one to give them the food from my own hands. You know, tahnik, when you feed a child something after you chew it, I will control them from birth to death. So Allah answered and said, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan illa man ittaba'aka min al -ghawin. You have no authority or power or control over my servants except those who follow you. Which means what? His power is only exhibited in our following of him. Like for example, if you are on a highway and it seems crowded, there's some accident or something, and then you're close to the exit, you take the exit. Somebody behind you says, it's crowded, he goes after you. Somebody goes after you. The crowd starts to go out into the exit, right? Whatever you do, they would normally follow unless they see signs for otherwise, right? So if you have a U-turn and you follow a U-turn, everybody will make a U-turn. They think that it is cleared. So the shaitan, Allah took out all coercive power from him. He doesn't have coercive powers. He cannot force you to follow him. And on the day of judgment, he will tell us, وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ it's up to you. I had no power over you except that I invited you and you obliged. Welcome. You obliged. You listened to him. You obeyed him. Allah says, Allah ta'budu shaytan. Innahu lakum aduun mubeen. I have taken your covenant, O children of Adam, that you never worship the shaytan, for he is your clear enemy. Wa an i'budun. And worship me. هذا صراط مستقيم. May Allah subhanahu wa taala guide us all to the صراط المستقيم. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد. Brothers and sisters, we are not going through these ayat and stories to entertain ourselves. 
or to become intellectually equipped with information. This information is related to our fate. It is about where we are, who is with us, who is against us. Which means it is like guiding posts to keep us on the straight path and to protect us from getting off the main road between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our hearts to believe in him and to submit to him and to accept him and to follow him and to live and die for him. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقواتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقواتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم اختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة